Hi, my name is Herman, and um, I would like to share my testimony of the things that have been occurring in my life, uh, my trajectory, and how God has always shown himself in every situation to make it better. Um, I would like to start with, uh, I originally came from Mexico. I was uh, nine years old when I came to Hermiston, Oregon. And uh, the Lord had a plan for me because the things that have been happening to me are, like a lot of other people out there, uh, pretty devastating, but we're all different. Uh, not everybody channels things the same way. For me, um, at the uh, very young age, I was just looking for somebody to always come to the rescue, per se. I mean, I don't know a better way to explain it other than I just knew that things that were happening since my childhood were not okay. Uh, there was always a doubt in my mind um, whether the, what was happening to me was uh, something big or, or it was no big deal. Um, there was really nobody ever around to tell me. It was hard for me to really understand what was happening. So at a very young age, um, when I was about five, six years old, I was molested by uh, a family member. I don't remember whether he was a cousin or an uncle. I've, I've just always thought that it was one of my uncles. And that was very devastating. Um, eventually, when it happened, I just didn't understand. I didn't know what to make of it, other than I just thought it was normal maybe it was hard for me to make up in my mind in my child mind what had happened all i know is it it, it, it was wrong because it happened in private no was nobody was around and somehow i felt taken advantage of so that was very hard uh but then um as years went by I had a feeling inside my heart that something big was coming. I, I always thought when I woke up every morning, something big is coming. I just didn't know what it was. It, it was just a feeling. Maybe it was hope. Maybe it was hope that my dad would be coming around and because um, he was gone for the most part when I was in Mexico um, all the way till you know I was nine years of age my dad would come to the U.S. and at the age of 35 I finally popped the question hey dad how long did you guys or that were you were you gone you know and he would say I was you know gone six months nine months and it, it was the way that he said it to me that kind of caught my attention like it was no big deal to him so you know I, I I started off by saying I just didn't know what to make of things because it just seemed that the way I grew up everything was like no big deal you know if, if somebody got shot no big deal if somebody you know uh, went through a devastation it was always that you know no big deal it kind of shocked me when my dad said that because I was like, well, it wasn't a big deal to you, but it was to me. You were gone. I needed you. So I, I, it seems like I always had that need for a big brother or my dad to be around and, and, and there was nobody around. So I suffered a lot of uh, anxiety when I was little. I was, I was thought that somebody was out to get me, you know, I was going to get beat up or something was going to happen. We finally came to the U.S., and when we did, uh, it, it, it just my life changed. We learned about Jesus. You know, my family was Catholic. I come from a, a very Catholic background. And then uh, my family finally coming to Hermiston. My uncles, they were all evangelized, uh, evangelizing my family. They were ev evangelicals, and they preached Jesus Christ to my mom and my dad. And so about the age of 12, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I was baptized at the age of 12. But things kept happening, though. Um, of course, like everyone else's life, things happen, you know, uh, trauma, you know. We actually had a house that caught on fire. We had to get out of there when I was with mom and dad, and we went to a different place there in Hermiston. And uh, I just didn't didn't understand the way things were happening. I didn't know what, what to make of it. 
Eventually, as, as time went on, I veered off the path of Christ and I went off to the world. I was a musician in uh, church. I started playing the drums. Uh, by the way, that's where I met my wife. I was 13 uh, years of age when I just met her. Uh, she had moved from Los Angeles, California into Hermiston. And, um, but then eventually, at about the age of 14, 15 years of age, I veered off to the world and, and I became a musician out in the world. I just basically forgot about the Lord after that. I, I had a fear in my heart knowing that, that, you know, when I was out playing and gigs and drinking, I got really bad when it comes to like weed, when it comes to like alcohol, especially meth too. I was very addicted to meth. I always knew there was something inside me that always told me, hey, this isn't the place for you. You're wrong, you know, this. But I did, I always pushed it away. I always thought, no. This is where I want to be. I know what church is. I know it's it's filled with hypocrites and kind of funny for me to think that way because like is is in life you choose what kind of hypocrite you want to be because no matter what people are hypocritical you know uh, whether you're out in the world or you're in church it doesn't matter you're, you could be a hypocrite. It's like saying well they're liars. Well aren't you liars out in the world? It's the same thing, right? So anyway, there was always something that told me this is not your place. You got to go back and um, eventually as time went when past. I, I decided, you know, I, that I didn't want that lifestyle anymore. I had gotten into a fornication and I went into a, how do you call it, a relationship that lasted almost five years. And that started back when I was 20 years of age. And I went there to that relationship and uh, it wasn't good. It, was, it wasn't good. I, I made that person suffer a lot because I didn't love her. I didn't feel any deep emotions for her. It was just all exterior. It was all um, perversity, basically, you know, um, just the need of a woman. And then I did a lot of harm. And I, and of course, I'm repentant of that. But eventually, uh, she decided to break up with me and said, I've had enough of this, you know, and uh, I fell into some, some kind of a depression. Um, one day coming back from Tri-Cities, this was already when I was about 25 years of age. I was coming back from Tri-Cities after rehearse, rehearsing with the band I was playing with here locally um, before crossing the bridge to Oregon. Um, just, I was driving my Mustang that I had purchased and I went all the way to 150 miles an hour. And I remember that before I crossed the bridge, I had this thought in my head, um, just turn the wheel to the right or to the left and your pain, your sorrow will be over. And by then I already had uh, two kids that I had outside marriage. Um, one was, his name Samuel, he's 23 years of age now. And then my daughter who passed away that I'll get to that story here in a second. But then there were kids when this was happening. Uh, they were not living with me. I just knew that, you know, they, they existed. My daughter, I had left in Mexico and my son, he, I didn't meet him till he was about four years of age. I didn't even know he existed. So, um, but by the time I was about to com commit suicide, I already knew of my son. I already knew of his existence. So before I actually decided to take my life, um, there, faces came to my mind. And I just bursted out in tears and I just started crying. I said, wait a minute, I can't go to mom. I can't go to dad. I don't really have friends and I can't even die. What am I going to do? And I, I just thought I was going to go crazy. So I was living in an apartment uh, at that time. And I went to my apartment and when I went upstairs and I just fell on my knees. You know, I was 25 years of age. I, I was already a grown adult and, and I knew what I was doing. I knew what was happening. And I decided to fall on my knees and just cry out to God. But it, I did a, a, a very disrespectful prayer. I didn't pray like I pray now. Um, I said, God, if you exist, if you could even hear me and if you could see me, and then I yelled the word help. And I said, help me. And I just started crying and I just started yelling. And of course, my, my neighbors thought I was a maniac because they could hear me yelling. And uh, but I know what I was going through. I, I needed breakthrough. I needed a change. I needed a, a, a shift in my life. And I knew 
from my past experiences that I knew it was Jesus. That's the only way anybody could come and really shift their life around. You can't do it without Him. You can try, but you will not have success. You will fall every time. You will collapse. You will crash and burn. God wants to save us. He wants to protect us. He wants to love us. He doesn't have anything outside of His love for us that, that would actually endanger us, that would actually bring us hurt, sorrow, pain. He does say in the Word that we will have affliction, but He doesn't say, I will afflict your heart, I will afflict your soul. It's just the Lord says that we will experience affliction. But to have hope, because He has overcome the world. So for me, I knew that that was the truth. I fell on my knees, I cried out to the Lord. Two weeks after that, just about two weeks after that, the girl that is now my wife, that I had met when I was 13 years of age, calls me and says, German, I know you're a very busy man. And I was thinking when she was saying that, busy, doing what, sin? <laughs> She's like, I know you're a busy man, you play, you know, but my pastor has moved from Los Angeles and started a church. And we're, we were starting a home groups, kind of like what we do at Hungry Gen. And uh, so we used to call, call those groups cellulas, like cells, you know. And uh, so we would get together in the pastor's house and she invited me over. I, I didn't know that they were doing anything like that. And uh, she says, come this Saturday, we, we need help with the music. I know you're a musician, we need musicians in the church. and. We're wondering if you could teach us. I said, yeah, what the heck, let's do it. You know, by this time, I didn't feel anything for my wife. I didn't want her to be my girlfriend or nothing like that. Years had passed by and I, I had just kind of resigned on the idea of becoming uh, her boyfriend or anything like that because there was so much rejection on her behalf that I was finally just let go of that idea. So when I finally went and, um, and I accepted the proposal, I went, and um, I showed up on a Saturday for their practice, and I was telling people how to play the keyboard, how to play the guitar, how to play the, the bass guitar, the drums. And um, at the end of it, they invited me to service on Sunday. And I said, sure, I'll be here. I got nothing to do. I didn't have a, a gig that weekend. And I, it was funny because the pastor, we had never met, but see, God is so powerful. He's so real that what happened in the preaching is that he said, I'm pretty sure, and this is towards the end of the preaching when I went on Sunday, he said, I'm pretty sure there's people here who need to reconcile with the Lord, who need to come to repentance. And there's one of you here that has doubted his very existence. And I mean, he pointed to us who were sitting at his house in his living room that day. And I mean, it was, it was almost like he was pointing at me. He wasn't literally pointing at me, but when he went like this, I was like, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I knew it was for me. He said, there's, some, there's one of you here that has doubted his very existence. Well, let me tell you something. And I mean, you could, you could imagine a Pentecostal preacher. I mean, he's yelling and, and you're like, whoa, you know, am I in trouble <laughs> but he said I know there's one of you here that has um, doubted his very existence and that you have asked in your heart if he could even hear you these were the very words I had said in my apartment when I collapsed and fell on my knees and I said God I know you, it's you I know it's you talking to me and he says is there anybody that wants to reconcile or want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and I raised both my hands I went up in the air and I said me I went, I crawled to the feet of the pastor that day and I hugged him from his feet. In my mind, I was envisioning Christ. I was a mess, I was crying, I was repented. And I said, no, I know you could hear me. I know it's you. And I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I reconciled. So from then, it's been 16 years now that I have served the Lord nonstop. Non-stop, no breaks. I don't take vacations from Christianity. I don't get burned out. I am grateful. I know what the Lord has done for me. Just me. I don't know what he has done for the rest of the world. I know what he's done for me. And, 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 and it works. His love, his mercy, his care, his compassion actually works. Huh, okay, so I got with this girl that I didn't think we were gonna become anything. 
because uh, I had resigned from the idea. Um, she was happy. She was, I mean, of course, we were friends. And um, by the way, I'm talking about who is my wife now, okay? So um, she, one night after that night, uh, we went back to service and we took a picture outside and, uh, you know, she put her cheek close to my cheek and her knees was like, hey, you guys look cute together and this and that. And she took a picture of us and I, just the smell that she carries with her, like her lotions. And just, I felt something ignited inside of me. It was like, wait a minute, is this that girl I met when I was 13? Is this the way it feels? Oh my God. So it's something ignited again for her. And so finally I popped the question, you know, just to make the long story short, I said, hey, uh, would you like to be my girlfriend? And here it comes. She said, no. And, you know, she was looking for a man of God, you know, somebody that she had already had her own, you know, testimony to tell that I can't, I'm not at the liberty to share here. Um, but of course, a lot of people that know her, she has her testimony and I will give her the chance to testify of how she, um, God has been dealing with her. But in that time that I had asked, I, I just didn't let go of the idea because the picture was handed to me. I took it to my apartment. And I couldn't stop staring at the picture and I was looking at her and I was, I was thinking, could it be that this is the woman that I'm going to marry? Could it be? And I was just always looking at the picture. But then uh, again, a second time I asked, Hey, would you be my girlfriend? She said no again. So three times she said no. Um, but finally I, I, I thought to myself, I'm going to ask one last time. This was during, uh, Christmas time. Uh, she had told me that she liked flat screen TVs. And so I had a flat screen TV. I took it away from my apartment. I went to her family's place and I asked for her keys. She thought it was weird that I was asking for her the key to her apartment, which anybody would, but she handed me her keys. I took my TV, took it to her house, installed it. And then I said, Hey, would you come with me? I, there's something in your apartment I want to show you. And I took her and I just kind of closed her eyes. We were still friends by this time. And, um, she opened the door and she saw the big flat screen TV and she was in shock. And she's like, oh my God, hey, that's your TV. What is it doing here? And I said, I want to give it to you. You know, it's just a present. I know you like them and I want you to have it. And uh, it's not that I want to take advantage of you, but I need to ask you again. But by this time, a lot of time had passed already since I reconciled with the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, she said this to me. She took a breath. She took a little pause and said, look, I'm going to give you a chance but don't lie to me. And that really stuck to me when she said, don't lie to me because I was a liar. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, don't lie. Okay. All right. Well, I can do that. I won't lie to you. Cause I, what I felt for her was real. And I knew it was, I knew it was because when I had met her, uh, something really sparked inside of me. Um, there was, I had, I just thought in my heart, I'd never seen a girl as beautiful as her. I, I just, there was something about her that just nobody else made me feel, uh, per se, you know? And so I said, okay, I won't lie to you. And there was another thing that she had said, um, to not break her heart. So I, I said, okay, I don't, I'm not here to break your heart, to lie to you. And, and I took on the challenge and she said that she would be my girlfriend and I became the happiest man in the world then. So I, uh, we engaged, we became boyfriend, girlfriend. And then, uh, three months after that, I gave her a ring, an engagement ring. And then, uh, after that up in the altar, I spoke to the guy that was our pastor that time. And I said, look, I want to propose to my wife up in the altar. I was a musician there, an active musician. And uh, I wasn't really playing a lot, but I was more than anything, a leader there. And uh, so he said, yeah, go for it. And so that day we had service and right in the middle of the service, we kind of stopped the whole thing. And, and uh, she was weirded out and I thought what's going on. And, and I, you know, the microphone was given to me and I said, you know, uh, I was just wondering uh, if you would like to be my wife, <laughs> you make me feel the happiest. Um, I want to be with you for the rest of my life. And uh, I had a friend who I was holding the microphone and he immediately went to her, made it all awkward and stuff. And kind of like, come on, answer. <laughs> and she said, yes, she accepted. And uh, she is now my wife, um, Gladys. Uh, the best thing that I have ever found outside of Christ, um, the woman that has stuck with me uh, through every situation in my life. And I love her dearly. 
She um, is my friend. She is somebody that I run to every time I'm devastated and every time I'm happy as well. Um, so she, she's she been with me ever since. And now um, throughout our marriage, things have been happening. Devastations have been occurring. And I'll just kind of skip all the way to where my grandfather back in January 18th of 2021, who was the guy that raised me when my dad was gone. So to me, my grandpa was my dad. Um, uh, although my grandfather was kind of a pretty bad influence in my life because he was drunk all the time. He was abusive. He would chase my mom around the house to, to, to hit her, physically abuse her. Uh, I don't think anything sexual, just all physical abuse, you know, like beating on my mom. And um, I never saw him do it, but I would see my mom running away from him and locking herself. And in Mexico, the doors are metal. So when you slam a door in Mexico, you could hear it. It's loud. Having that influence in my life was pretty negative, but it was the guy that, that raised me. And to him in Mexico, in our tradition, you respect your grandparents, you respect your elders. I know it is a little bit different in different nations, but in, in Mexico, you have a lot of respect for your elders, especially your grandparents. And if it's people that are nurturing you, people that are feeding you, people that are teaching you how to live life, you have just the utmost respect. So my grandfather passes. He passes on January 18th. And that was very devastating to me because I actually wanted to go at least, at the very least, bury him. And I couldn't at the time. It was very unfortunate that I wasn't able to make it. It hurt me a lot. And uh, basically my dad had passed away in my heart. And so for him to have passed, I didn't, uh, I didn't know how to channel that. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to get up from this. I know that God is uh, good and his love is powerful. So just about two months after that, I get in a very massive accident um, coming back from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and I thought that day that I was going to die. I had an accident on a semi truck where I was traveling about 55 miles an hour. I was headed over to Caldwell and I was going to get a load there. Uh, I was empty. So there was rain on the road. The traffic was crazy. I mean, I had people passing me left and right, literally, because the lanes there, I think it's a four or five lane, uh, I-84. And so what happened is uh, there was an accident a quarter of a mile, according to the officers that um, were on the scene after my accident. And they told me that there was an accident that caused my accident. So what happened, everybody that was in front of me came to a complete stop. And of course, when you're driving a big 18 wheeler, which at the time, that's what I was driving, an 18 wheeler, uh, there was there was not a lot of room for you to make decisions and, and just bring everything to a halt. So all I remember seeing in front of me, I don't know if you guys have seen before, you know, baby on board, but I saw this on the back of a window. And when I saw that, I was like, no, there's no way that I'm going to crash into and plow through the traffic in front of me. There's families in front of me. So I decided to hurt myself and I jackknifed the truck purposely. And what jackknife is, is, you know, basically it's just your truck coming close to your trailer. And so I went and, and just crashed against the barrier, the concrete barrier that divides the interstate and uh, just blew my truck to pieces and um, came off of there. Uh, just devastated. I didn't know whether I had killed anybody or not. Um, I know that I wasn't hurt because I was able to walk out of my truck and uh, just to make sure that everything was okay for the most part, whatever was gonna be okay. And uh, there was somebody who was involved, but wasn't hurt. After that accident, um, I, I really did think that maybe I could, you know, recover, um, but then something else happened. It's like, that was the beginning of chaos for my life. Cause um, till that point, it seems like everything was going pretty well. Um, I had my own business. I was owner operator. I was pulling four different units and I was, it was my project. It was my baby and I was growing $50,000 a year. But then that something else that happened was uh, just, you know, after, after that accident, 
the first thing that happened was my grandfather's death and then my accident that happened you know uh so january was for my grandfather and then march uh, is when i got an accident in my truck and um, then my wife came to pick me up three days after the accident and I was thinking, okay, I was recovering from my grandfather's death, and now I got in an accident. And then my son, who is right now in jail, had came to live with us, and he was staying in our house. Um, and he almost cost me a divorce. He went ahead and, and said a bunch of things to my wife um, that discouraged her from staying with me. And of course, these were all attacks of the devil, I feel, um, because Satan has this way of attacking us, where he'll attack you in, in, in the way that you are most vulnerable to. So I believe that he knew exactly where to hit me to bring me down. And so that something else that happened was my son trying to cause a divorce between me and my wife. And I thought that was going to be over, you know? I mean, I, I cried. I told my wife, look, dude, I didn't raise this kid. He has hate in his heart. He has a lot of resentment, you know? He's in drugs. You can't believe everything he says. And of course, a lot of people that might hear this would, would think, well, there could be truth or there could be whatever, one way or the other. But before the Lord, I'm telling you, a lot of the things that he said were not true. Uh, there were very, there were lies that were made up. And um, so, but my wife was vulnerable. She, she, you know, was uh, convinced by a lot of the things that he said, um, because in her state, um, it was just hard for her to receive all this information and, and didn't know what to do with it. But eventually she healed from it. You know, we got up, we continued our marriage, and then something else happened. My house caught on fire. And I mean, it was like one devastation, literally one devastation after another. You know, my grandpa dying, then my accident, and then my son, wanting to cause a divorce, then just a little bit after that, another two or three months after that, my house catches on fire. And it's like, I don't know what's happening. Like I'm barely tr accepting healing from one of my devastations and then another one comes my way. Okay, so um, I thought the house, you know, okay, it's all right. You know, it's just something that's here in, in, the, in earth. You know, we could buy another house. We could rebuild this house, maybe. Who knows? You know, but I thought it's just material stuff, you know? Nobody died. You know, thank God nobody died. My son, um, my son who's 18 years old now, was inside the bathroom when this happened, when the house caught on fire, and he wasn't hurt. He came out basically undressed, you know, just a towel around him. And I mean, he was scared. He didn't know what to do. He called me. I was driving at the time over in a town called Pendleton, Oregon. And um, he told me he didn't have good news for me. And he told me the devastation that our house was on fire. And so we drove, we came in a hurry and uh, we did what we were supposed to. The firemen showed up, they did what they could. We went to a hotel that same night, and then we received a call from one of our neighbors saying, hey, your house is on fire again. The, the firemen thought that they had consumed the fire. Apparently they didn't because the house was on fire again. And this second fire, my house went down in ruins completely down and it just broke me. We went from the hotel at 1.32 in the morning and me and my wife saw our house, my hard work of nine years go down in flames. And that was hard. That was very hard. But still, for me, my background was, hey, no big deal, right? You know, it'll it'll be okay. And it was just a, it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't it wasn't a feeling of no big deal like like the kind of comfort that you find in the Lord. It was more like human like okay, well, no big deal. We lost it, we'll regain it. So it wasn't necessarily the comfort of God. It was more like just me and my human state, you know, saying we could rebuild from this. <sighs> and then something else happened. And this Next one that I'm gonna share is the one that really hits home for me because it was the one that really broke me. 
everything else that happened, I could recover from. But my baby daughter, who was 21 years of age, suffered an accident, a head-on collusion on a motorcycle, flew 40 feet up in the air, and when she landed, he, she cracked her skull open and had immediate death. For me, this one was the hardest. And I didn't, I knew this whole time, I didn't want to question God. I didn't want to say, why did you let it happen? Like I've heard testimonies and my respects and my heart goes out to people that have lost their mom or dad or kids or anybody. And they haven't been able to channel what they've been through. For me, I knew I was human and I was just as human as God would be as God was ever going to be, as God as always. And I never wanted to question the Lord. I didn't want to think that I wasn't in any posture to question God for what I've been going through. So there is a scripture that motivates me throughout this whole thing um, because I didn't want to question God in terms of why did you allow this to happen? Where was, where was your help when my daughter was flying up in the air 40 feet? I didn't want to say any of that. I felt it in my heart, but I didn't say it. I didn't, it didn't actually come out of my mouth. It was just in my heart. Then there's a scripture um, that is found in Job chapter 42, verse one and forward. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I didn't want to have the behavior of you answered to me, God. I always knew God was God, and God never stops being God. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I know, I knew back then, that the same God, the same power that raised me back to acknowledge Him and get me out of that desperate world that I was living on before I actually tried to commit suicide, I knew He could come out and help me. The church that I attend to now that is called Hungry Gen started a fast during that time that this happened with my daughter. And I made a deal with God and I said, Lord, I'm going to just dive nose first into ministry just completely and just 100 percent i'm just going to pour my whole life into you and i'm talking about voluntarily like not like full-time ministry now i want to get paid nothing like that just me out of my heart out of the necessity of god i'm desperate i don't know what to do other than run to you and so i went on a 21 day fast the first eight days um, were hell for me because I had so much just friction, a lot of pullback inside of my heart. Like, what is going on? Like, what am I doing? Is this really happening to me? Just assimilating my daughter's death in my human state was very hard to overcome. So I, I knew that the only way to overcome this was diving into the spiritual world with the where the spirit of God uplifts you and gives you strength because he is my source he is the reason why I'm still here why I'm still alive there's a purpose I've always asked and I've asked my family you have to ask in your brain and your head why am I here and for what am I here so I was thinking, okay, Lord, you are going to do something. I know it. I could feel it. So eight days went by. And then finally on the ninth day, I felt like I was on cruise control. Just this peace from the Lord came. I had went nine days without eating. I think that the longest fast I had done before was a full Sunday from the morning all the way to night and then eating the next day. That's as far as I had ever gotten. This idea of 21 days of fasting was massively nuts in my head, but I went on it. And I know that the Holy Spirit was the one who gave me the power to endure this fast. I had never thought it would be possible. I had heard of people fasting even up to 40 days. I never believed it. I never thought it was real. I thought they were lying. But now for me to go 21 days without food, just water, was a miracle. And that 21 day fast, my friends, is what actually did it for me. That's when God showed me his love. And you know, there, there's one last thing I wanna share. As a daddy, I had this feeling in my heart of revenge of who was, who were involved in my daughter's death, 
who is responsible for my daughter's death. And I knew there was two guys involved. The guy that was driving the car the opposite direction and then the guy that was driving the motorcycle, which my daughter, my daughter was right behind this guy. And I said, these guys are responsible and they're gonna have to pay. That was my daddy's heart, okay? Any dad that has their kids with them understands and won't judge me understands what I mean, daddy heart. When I was in the airplane flying to Mexico, I had this idea that I was gonna make them pay, not necessarily kill them or do something harmful to them, but put them in jail till they would rot in jail. That was my plan. And I was going to Mexico to bury my daughter, obviously. Um, that was the most important plan. But in Mexico, they, they let you decide what's gonna happen to the criminals basically you decide what kind of sentence they're gonna have and so they were just waiting for me and I uh, on my way there I noticed there was things happening because we took our flight and when we were in San Diego and we crossed over to Tijuana the flight was delayed six hours and so when I finally got onto another flight um, I was already running late my wife just needed to go to the bathroom. She went and on her way to the bathroom, I looked out the window of the airplane and I saw this beautiful sun in the clouds. It almost looked like I could walk on the clouds. It looked like the floor. And I remembered that in scripture, our sky is my God's floor. To me, the highest place is the feet of my Jesus. And I remembered when this happened, the, the pain of losing my daughter was too overwhelming. I remembered in my heart my intentions of what I was going to do when I got to Mexico. Holy Spirit comes in me and tells me, you're going to forgive them. I said, why? Why are you asking me? How can you ask me to forgive these men that took my baby from me? And Holy Spirit told me, Christ was taken for you so that you could live so that you could have a relationship with your Father in heaven. And I, and I remember that. It was, I was reminded of that. And so when I went to Mexico and I finally buried my daughter and, and, and all of that happened, there was people waiting me waiting for me at the courthouse where there was actually a jail. And I had requested to speak to the men responsible of my daughter's death. Now there was a judge, there was lawyers, there was officers, there was guards involved. And so they made it very hard for me to actually speak to these men. And I made it very clear, I'm not gonna insult them. I'm not gonna yell at them. I'm just, I'm just wanting to forgive them. I don't wanna take this burden back to where I live, where I came from. And so I went the next day after they made it, their decision and the answer was, yes, you could talk to them. By the time I went to go talk to the guy that had collided with my daughter, who was a teacher, um, I saw him on a corner wearing a leather jacket. And as I was walking up to him, he already knew I was, I was gonna come talk to him. He was shaking, he was trembling. And I said, good afternoon, sir, how are you doing? And he turns around very slowly and says, well, with his hands in his pockets. And he says, well, I'm right here, embarrassed of what I have done. And he started crying and I could see the pain in his eyes. Holy Spirit had already been working with me. And I actually was able to see the pain in somebody else's heart. If I would have been emotionally driven, I wouldn't have been able to see his pain. I wouldn't have cared. I would have cared for my pain only. But Holy Spirit had already worked in my life to where when I went there, I could see this guy's pain. So when I spoke to him, I said, look, I only came here to tell you that I forgive you. He ran up to me and he put his hands through the bars and snatches me and holds me and my wife and cries and kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I told him, it's okay, I forgive you, I forgive you. So when I looked back, my friends, this is what really got me. That when I looked back, I saw a judge, I saw cops, I saw officers, I saw guards, everybody was crying. What had happened is that God was revealing himself to these people through my pain. He was actually showing them what forgiveness looks like 
through my pain. And glory be to him. After that, I went to go speak to the guy who was driving the motorcycle and his leg was broken. And I asked him how he was doing. He said, my legs broke, but my heart's more broke. He started crying. I told him as well, I forgive you. I came here to tell you that. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I, I will not sentence you. I will not bring anything up on you that will uh, um, afflict you or that will bring any kind of pain to you. I let you just be free. You, I have nothing against you. It's okay. And I did, I did take the time to tell them about a king in the Word of God that had forgiven a guy who had came and became a debtor to him. And this debtor went out and didn't forgive somebody who became a debtor to him. And when the king found out, it, it wasn't good for that man. I didn't want to be like him. I wanted to forgive just like, like God has forgiven me. Now, of course, this offense was big. It was huge. It was massive. But still, there is no sin out there that God won't forgive if you come with a repentant heart. That is my story. My name is Herman, and I hope that this could encourage anybody out there feeling like there is no hope, feeling like there's no way that I could forgive you for what you've done. I would encourage anybody in my shoes or in, in a situation close to mine that there is a way. His name is Jesus. There is a power through the Holy Spirit that you could come and actually forgive. You can actually give forgiveness to people out there. I would encourage you that any situation that you're living out there, the power of God, the love of God, the mercy, the compassion that God holds could actually fall on you if you accept it. I am Herman Velasquez. I am very glad that I could share this with you and encourage you and that there's always a way to live a prosperous life, especially when you come to forgiveness.